Hello viewers, thank you once again for tuning in to Alpha One Canada's 2015 Virtual Education Summit. My name is Duncan Lamb and I'm your host. I'd like to welcome our speakers today from Alberta Health Services, Julie Gallas and Melissa Fontaine. Julie and Melissa will be talking to us about exercise and Alpha One antitrypsin deficiency. Julie, Melissa, I'll let you say a few words to our audience before we proceed to your presentation. Do you mind sharing with us your experience and your area of expertise? Thanks, Duncan. I'm Julie. I have about 18 years experience of a, as a respiratory therapist with Alberta Health Services. I've been doing pulmonary rehab with exercise for the last 15 years, and I'm also a certified respiratory educator. I've been working most of my career with people with chronic lung disease, so I'm looking forward to you viewers seeing it, and if you have any questions, we can certainly talk about it during the panel. And I'm Melissa Fontaine. I'm a kinesiologist with Alberta Health Services. I'm a, a Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology certified exercise physiologist and have been working with pulmonary rehab for only the past six years, unlike Julie. Um, my other areas of expertise are cardiac rehab, um, uh, therapeutic exercise, as well as exercise for chronic disease management. So I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to share the information on exercise with all of you. Okay. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much, Melissa. Well, I know we're very excited to, to get to uh, Julie and Melissa's presentation. So let's get started. Thank you for that introduction, Duncan. This is Julie, and I'm going to begin to talk about the reasons why we might exercise. For patients diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, exercise is an important part of prevention and progression of the symptoms. It's also a way for patients with moderate and severe lung disease to manage the symptoms and to be able to fully participate in their activities of daily living. Symptoms can present in your early 40s and 50s and appear somewhat like asthma. It can be often misdiagnosed as this. You may get some wheezing and some coughing and some shortness of breath. Because lifestyle can be a contributing factor to how the disease progresses, it's important to address things like smoking, nutrition, and lack of exercise. For those patients with lung involvement, damage is being done to the air sacs in those lungs, which causes limitations to the airflow while breathing out. Because of this, the airways tend to collapse and air becomes trapped into the lungs. The faster you breathe, the more air becomes trapped. So with exercise, people are feeling more short of breath the faster they're breathing. Because of this, people tend to limit their ability to exercise. This can impact heavily on the patient and their family and can cause people to become physically less active and are not able to participate in the things that they enjoy in life. In our pulmonary rehab program that we do here, I have most patients say to me, well, why should I exercise? I'm already quite short of breath. So this is true because of many reasons. The onset of the symptoms can happen slowly over a period of time and individuals subconsciously limit or eliminate some of their most strenuous activities because they're short of breath. This results in further deconditioning of the muscles and they tend to become less physically active and their muscles become less efficient when you're using them. And because of this less efficiency, it takes a little bit more effort for the patient to do the same task that they would have done before. And the requirements used for oxygen for these same tasks tend to go up. So you're more short of breath, so you don't do as many things, and your muscles become weak, and it takes more oxygen to do the same task. So because of this, it works in a vicious cycle and develops exertional shortness of breath, and it leads to further inactivity. There are many benefits to exercise for people with chronic health conditions, especially lung disease. 
Exercise can increase the efficiency with which your body works. So for an example would be your heart and your lungs work a little bit more efficiently and it takes less energy to be able to do the same amount of work. Because of that, you're able to sustain your activity for longer periods or to be able to do more at one time. So for example, maybe previously you were only able to walk one block. So the more you exercise, you may be able to walk three or four blocks. So it increases how long you're able to do that activity. Also because your body is getting more used to doing activities, it takes less energy to do things and it will decrease your shortness of breath because of that. Some more benefits of exercise include help to maintain healthy body weight. The more you weigh, the more energy it takes to do everyday activities. So the less you weigh at a healthy weight, it takes less energy to do the same amount of work. It also increases bone strength, increases your ability to fight infection, and it really does have an effect on your mood and increase your energy level. So because of this, it increases your quality of life and will decrease other comorbidities that you may have because of your lung disease. Self-management is central to successfully maintaining a good quality of life. Exercise is a key component to this. Preventative steps should be initiated as early as possible to reduce the likelihood of the progression of the disease and to limit its impact. Early detection offers the opportunity for early and effective self-management of the disease. The interaction between genes and environment can cause the disease to worsen. Things like smoking, nutrition, and exercise must be addressed, and introducing a disease management strategy can arrest or limit the disease process. Successful disease management depends on the patient's ability to self-motivate. Focusing on important things like prevention of infection, medication, and exercise will help the patient lead a good quality of life. You can't change the fact that you've been diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but you have some control over the progression of the disease. Going back to the question of why should I exercise when I'm feeling so short of breath, there are many different ways we can manage your shortness of breath while you're doing your activity to make it a little bit more comfortable. We always recommend that you use all of your medication as prescribed by your physician. This includes all of your inhalers and all of your pills. The other thing we recommend is carrying a rescue inhaler with you at all times. So this is generally your blue puffer, your salbutamol, or your Ventolin. And what that does is if you run into trouble where you're feeling so short of breath or you're wheezing, you can take your rescue inhaler to provide some relief for you. Mobility aids can also be really helpful while doing activities. An example would be a walker. So a walker has a couple of advantages. It takes a little bit less energy to walk with a walker than it does without. So if you want to save up your energy for your breathing, using a walker may be helpful for you. It also has a seat often in a four-wheeled walker. So if you need to take a rest and there's no chair, you have the ability to sit down and rest. And that is something that we recommend in our pulmonary rehab program is to take frequent rests. We would rather you take many rests and be able to go further than we would for you to keep going until you're so short of breath you can't go any further. So we like to make sure people take rests before they get to that point where they're feeling really short of breath. And once they feel rested, they can get up and walk a little bit further. So also to help manage your shortness of breath, we do have some breathing techniques that we teach so that people aren't feeling so short of breath and it can manage how you're feeling. The first breathing technique that we use in our program is called pursed lip breathing. So pursed lip breathing is an exercise used to help slow down your breathing and it causes a little back pressure when you breathe out so it takes a little bit longer to breathe out. That back pressure also causes your airways to splint open so we don't have that collapse of the airways as much when you're exercising. So it also helps to increase your oxygen level and push the oxygen across into your bloodstream. So the way you do it is you take an inhale, so breathe in through your nose for two counts. 
One, two, and then exhale. So breathe out of your mouth for four counts and create a pursed lip or a back pressure when you're breathing out. And that is a count of four. So inhale for a count of two, one, two, and exhale for a count of four with the pursed lip, one, two, three, four. Pursed lip breathing is also a good exercise to do when you're feeling anxious or really short of breath. It can really slow your breathing down and calm you a little bit so you're able to continue participating in your activity. The diaphragm is the most important muscle of breathing. With most obstructive lung diseases, we trap air into our lungs and it chronically is pushing our diaphragm in the down position. So we're not able to use it when we're breathing in and out. This breathing exercise called diaphragm breathing or belly breathing uses your belly to push your diaphragm up and down so we're able to get air into our lungs and breathe the air out. This breathing exercise can be used in conjunction with pursed lip breathing to have some relief when you're feeling quite short of breath. Diaphragm breathing can take a lot of practice so I usually recommend you do this at home while you're laying in bed. So what you do is you lie on your back with your knees up. Place one hand on your belly and the other hand on your chest. So make sure keeping your chest still, you take a breath in and you push your belly out. And when you go to breathe out, you squeeze your belly in. Now it seems a little bit opposite of how we feel like we would normally breathe and we really have to think about doing it. So I'm gonna do it again with you. So place one hand on your belly and the other on your chest. And remember to keep your chest still. You're not using your shoulders or your chest to take a breath. You're using your belly. So breathe in and push your belly out. And now breathe out and squeeze your belly in. Now I hope that your chest was staying still while you're doing this. And please try and practice this quite a bit at home. You will commit it to memory and it will become a little bit easier for you. One of the most important types of exercise you can do for your heart and lung health is endurance training, regardless of whether or not you currently have lung disease. Endurance training is considered any activity in which the body's large muscles move in a rhythmic manner for a sustained period of time. So that's any activity like walking, running, swimming, or cycling. We do recommend that you perform these activities on three to five days per week. However, it is safe to complete endurance training or cardiovascular training seven days per week. Uh, the recommended period of time is 20 to 60 minutes with an accumulated duration of 150 minutes per week of what's considered moderate intensity. So you're looking to achieve between a four and a six on the Borg shortness of breath scale or a 12 to 14 on the rate of perceived exertion scale. The Borg shortness of breath scale is as outlined here. So a zero represents no shortness of breath at all, all the way up to a 10, which would be considered very, very severe shortness of breath or maximal. Ideally, your cardiovascular exercise or your endurance training should have you feeling somewhat severe or severe shortness of breath. The Borg rate of perceived exertion scale is intended to represent how hard you feel you're working. So there's no right or wrong answer, it's simply a reflection of how hard you feel assigned to a number. A six means that you're not working very hard at all, all the way up to a 20, which would be maximal all-out exertion. You would only be able to maintain a 20 for a matter of seconds at the most. We are aiming for between a 12 and a 14 for your target exercise training zone. So again, for your cardiovascular exercise or your endurance training, you want to be working at the point where you can definitely tell that you're doing something but you feel that you could continue on for some time. 
For those of you whose lung function has been affected as a result of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, continuous cardiovascular exercise may not be the best option. You may experience severe shortness of breath, lower extremity or leg fatigue, or even have anxiety related to a fear of experiencing shortness of breath. Therefore, interval training may be a better option. Research has shown that the benefits are similar to those of continuous training, and it is often better tolerated due to less shortness of breath. We do recommend that you begin with a 30 second work to rest ratio. So that means 30 seconds working at a moderate to high intensity and 30 seconds of rest or lower intensity. You should aim to work up to completing 30 to 60 minutes in total duration, including your rest. Just as cardiovascular or endurance training helps keep the heart and lungs strong, it is important to include resistance or strength training in your routine to keep your muscles strong. As we discussed previously, strong muscles contribute to a more efficient body as a whole. This means your muscles don't need to use as much oxygen for day-to-day -day activities. Resistance training is considered any activity forcing the muscles to work against some type of force or resistance to improve muscular strength, power, endurance, and mass. We recommend you perform these types of activities on two to three days a week making sure that you're taking at least one day of rest and recovery in between those sessions. That allows the muscles enough time to repair themselves. Make sure your resistance training exercises include both the front and the back side of the body as well as the upper and the lower extremities. We recommend you complete one to three sets of eight to 12 repetitions. A rep or a repetition is simply repeating the same movement over and over and over again, in this case, eight to 12 times. A set is a grouping of those repetitions. You want to make sure you're taking 20 to 30 seconds of rest after completing each set or grouping of those eight to 12 reps. When performing your resistance training or strength training exercises, there are some important considerations. One of the most frequent questions I get asked is how do I know how much I should be doing? We use what's called the two for two principle or the overload principle. The idea here is if you are easily able to complete one to two additional repetitions for two consecutive training sessions at the current weight you're using, you should consider increasing the amount of weight or resistance, the number of repetitions, or the sets. On the reverse side of that, if you're struggling to complete the predetermined number of repetitions that you have selected, you should consider either decreasing the amount of weight you're lifting or the number of repetitions or the sets. Remember, we only want to change one thing at a time, so don't try to change all three at once. Breathing, of course, is another important factor here. Earlier, we introduced you to pursed lip breathing. It's a great tool to use while you're doing your resistance training exercises, but keeping in mind that you want to be exhaling or breathing out on the harder part of the exercise and inhaling or breathing in on the recovery part. That's often the most challenging part of all of your resistance training. People always want to do the opposite. So be patient with yourself as you learn that proper process. It's the most important factor for keeping the heart rate down, keeping the blood pressure down, as well as helping with that recovery so you can perform the next lift. 
One of the other questions I often receive is whether or not using elastic tubing or resistance bands is as effective as traditional resistance equipment like dumbbells or free weights or even exercise equipment that you may see in the gym. Tubing actually can promote a greater improvement in your functional exercise capacity. So really the take home message here is that using tubing or elastic has been shown to have the same or very similar benefits to using traditional resistance equipment. In fact, one study even showed a 73 meter improvement in a six minute walk test with a resistance training program that used TheraBand or tubing for eight weeks, three times a week. The final part of a well-rounded exercise program that we would like to discuss today is stretching. Stretching is considered gentle pulling and holding of the muscles at the greatest length to promote an improvement in your flexibility. Stretching is safe to perform daily and in fact is encouraged. It will decrease your chance of injuring yourself, help the muscles to recover by bringing blood flow to the area, improve your range of motion in both the muscles and the joints, as well as promote some relaxation. Your stretches should be performed when the muscles are warm, so ideally looking at doing them after you've done some endurance training or cardiovascular exercise. You can do them in the morning if you're feeling a little bit stiff, but we do recommend that you wait an hour or so to allow the body to at least warm up a little bit. Remember that all your stretches should be done in the pain-free range, so although it might feel uncomfortable, your stretches should never be considered painful. Make sure you're holding your stretch at least 30 seconds or longer and repeating each one two to three times. A good pulmonary rehab program should include all of these things that Melissa was talking about stretching, endurance, and strength training. In our program that we do here, we generally have multi-disciplines, so we have respiratory therapy, kinesiology, and a nurse, and of course we have physician involvement with it as well. The education is delivered by other disciplines and, and include a dietitian, a physiotherapist, a pharmacist, occupational therapy, and sometimes even psychology. Focusing on prevention of disease progression, improving symptom control, so things like shortness of breath and exercise tolerance are very important. Also, preventing infections, how to use your medications and what they're for, nutrition, so we want to make sure you're eating the proper foods and improving your quality of life. Pulmonary rehab is recommended for those with moderate and severe lung disease but it's strongly encouraged with anyone with any lung disease to have an exercise routine no matter how you're feeling. Before starting any exercise program for people with chronic lung disease, it's important to discuss the exercise with your physician. In our program, we have physician referral initially into the program. Patients are then assessed by a respiratory therapist, including a six-minute walk test. Some of the testing required for the program is a recent pulmonary function test, a recent chest x-ray, and an ECG to rule out comorbidities or make sure that you're stable to exercise for the program. They are also screened by a respirologist. If you do have a respirologist looking after you, that's very important to discuss with them what types of exercise they would and wouldn't recommend. It is important to discuss your disease management strategy with your physician and exercise should be a part of that. If you have any previous history of injuries, modifications may be needed for the exercise by a qualified professional. This might be done through your physician, a physiotherapist, or a kinesiologist. If you have a problem with balance or you're extremely short of breath, like previously stated, having a mobility aid may be beneficial to you. And always bring your rescue inhaler with you. Drinking plenty of water also helps your muscles work better and helps send out the secretions if you're getting a lot of mucus. 
We have many patients that ask us, what about using oxygen for when I exercise? Presently, long-term oxygen should be used for patients whose oxygen level is low at rest. Therefore, they would be using the oxygen at rest and when they're walking. It may help to relieve some shortness of breath and improve endurance for those who only have low blood oxygen on exertion, but there isn't a lot of evidence that it improves quality of life. So therefore, it isn't really supported or funded in most provinces. It's best to be assessed by your physician and respiratory therapist to determine what your need is and what your funding is presently in your province. In summary, we hope that through this presentation you have gained an understanding of the importance of exercise and it is possible to be physically active regardless of your condition. Now it's all up to you. This concludes today's speech and presentation. On behalf of Alpha One Canada, I would like to thank Julie Gallas and Melissa Fontaine for taking the time to prepare and speak to our viewers. I have a feeling that our viewers will benefit tremendously from this presentation. Please remember to check out the rest of our 2015 Virtual Education Summit featured videos on our website, www.alpha1canada.ca. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.